Good morning, everybody, and welcome for FRS Digital. Um, today we're talking to Jemima Atkins, and um, hopefully we'll be able to also speak to Nadia Woodhouse, if she's able to join us later. Um, the idea behind the session is we're going to talk about career stories, and hopefully the audience can ask any questions that they'd like. Um, specifically today, we're really delving into how maths has helped your career or inspired it or what it means to you. Um, this is part of our Maths for Girls project, although I must say, you don't have to be a girl to watch and listen to this. It is useful learning for anybody. Um, but it's in partnership with the US charity 100 Women in Finance with the aims to inspire and encourage girls, particularly around about the ages of 11 and 14, to take maths beyond GCSEs and hopefully even the gender divide when they get to A-levels and then university. Because it is such a core skill to have yeah. when you go into the world of work. So, my name is Alison Rowe McCune. I am one of the engagement managers here at Founders for Schools. I'm hosting today's session. Um, Founders for Schools is a charity that connects um, business people with the world of education with the hope that young people become inspired and a bit more educated about what is actually needed and what's out there in the world of work so that it can help young people plan their futures better um, and make informed decisions. So a little bit of housekeeping if you are with us um, you will notice that um, the only faces that you see are the myself and the speakers and um, we're doing that for safeguarding purposes and um, your audio and video is switched off however you can ask questions at any point and we encourage you to do so but i also have a very big list of questions anyway so we're covered no matter what and um, we are recording the session and it will be featured on both our platform and our youtube channel after this so if you want to go back and watch anything again you can do also, if you want to share it, that's, we encourage that greatly. So, Jemima, first of all, could you tell us what you do? What's your job title, please? Absolutely. Um, so, uh, I work in the world of infrastructure investing, which is something that I never thought I would be doing, but here I am. Um, what that means is, uh, if a company is looking to uh, build or expand an existing or new infrastructure asset, then they come to us to help provide that money. So when we talk about infrastructure assets, it's very, very broad. It can cover um, energy. So for example, um, solar farms, wind panels, obviously renewables are um, hugely important to us at the moment, given the climate transition. Uh, it also encompasses transport assets. So for example, here in the UK, we have financed um, the M6, which is a road uh, near Birmingham, and also the M8 up near uh, Edinburgh. Uh, ports, so um, Dover Port, also Dublin Port in Ireland. Airports, we, we have an investment in Edinburgh Airport. Uh, and um, also transport related assets, such as motorway service areas. It can also encompass utilities. So um, on the continent, especially in the Nordics, we have quite a lot of investments in companies which own electricity distribution lines. Um, in southern Europe, we have some investments in gas distribution lines, which are, again, um, although we don't invest in um, upstream oil and gas, so when you're sourcing the oil and gas initially, we do invest in the assets which distribute them, and obviously we're working with those um, companies towards transitioning to the net zero carbon future. So uh, it's 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 very broad. I really enjoy it because I get to look at lots of different types of assets which really affect every day to day life. You don't need to be an expert in roads to understand how a road works. Um, you just need to have a inquisitive mind um, be very quantitative in terms of modeling the revenues and costs. Uh, and also um, keen to ask questions. A lot of what I do involves going out and seeing these assets and um, talking to the people about how they're running them and what, what they're seeing to the future, what risks do they see to their, to their operations, um, and really getting drilling down and understanding what are the risks when I'm making an investment. We, in, we can invest for up to 40 years, so sometimes we're taking a very, very long-term view on these assets. Obviously, it depends on it depends on the type of asset as to how long we invest. Um, but obviously, that has a big bearing on uh, the type of mindset you need to have to work in this part of the investment universe. Okay, so that actually sounds really, really interesting. Mm -hmm. But a lot of it, to people who aren't used to the world to work, that might be 
whoa, I, I don't quite, I can't grasp that. So what, what does that mean in a daily basis or a weekly basis? What, what, what does that mean when you come into the office? If indeed you come into the office, you're looking to Sure. <laughs> well, I have actually come in today um, because uh, um, my Wi-Fi is not good enough at home, but um, uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. So a, I suppose talk you through a deal, deal cycle. So a company will approach us saying, let's say, um, think of an example, let's take an energy asset. Let's say it's a wind farm. We want to build a wind farm um, off the north coast of Germany. Uh, we think it's going to cost this much. We think it's going to have an operating life of 25 years. And the German government, this is completely hypothetical, has said that they are going to pay a fixed price for the power, the electricity that that wind farm generates for 20 years. So I know if I'm investing, if I'm providing the money to help them build that wind farm, I've got a five year we call it tail at the end of that life where we're not sure when the government is going to be stop paying that fixed price for electricity and i'm going to have to be start selling that electricity onto the market so on a day-to-day -day basis what do i do i talk to advisors to understand about the um power price hi nadia um, about the power price um forecasts i'm talking to technical advisors to understand how they're building that wind farm and why they're using a particular type of blade rather than a different brand of blade as in the, the blades of the wind turbine that I'm familiar with. Um, I'm talking, uh, I'm, I'm building a really big, we call it a financial model in Excel where um, I can uh, sensitize and imagine what the financials of that company are going to be. So for example, if the power price goes up or down, how much money as an investor I, am I going to make in my return? Um, I'm also talking to lawyers a lot. A big part of my job is reading legal documents and understanding how they're structured and how we're going to structure our investment in such a way that um, we're, we're protected in case something goes wrong. So um, as I, I really enjoy my job, it's, it's a nice mix of quantitative in terms of, well, maths, you know, I spend a lot of my time on Excel trying to understand the numbers, but also talking to people and really asking those questions to understand what's going on. Okay, great. And can we just say welcome to Nadia? Sorry, you had a little bit of trouble getting on there. So um, just to kind of recap, Jemima just told us what it is she does. So maybe if we start with the same with you, if you could tell us what your job is then, please, Nadia. Yeah, absolutely. Can you hear me okay? You can, yes. That's my great. sincere apologies for being late. Some technical issues on my side. You think so? And hi, everyone. Lovely, lovely to, uh, to meet you all. My name's Nadia. Um, so I work for Ernst & Young. Um, they're a really large global company. Uh, we have 300, almost 300,000 people that work across the world. And my job at the moment is I run a really small team of six people within that 300,000 uh, group. Uh, and we, my role is to help create um, articles and short videos and films for uh, business leaders, CEOs and um, board directors to understand kind of future trends, to think about how to run their businesses as we kind of navigate our way through changing dynamics of the economic system and how we kind of uh, build kind of resilience after this COVID pandemic. So um, that's kind of what I'm doing right, right now. And uh, I, from a, I don't know if you want to go, to go into my the sort of history, but, you know, as a, from a, you know, currently what we're doing right now is, um, is doing a lot of research, a lot of data analysis and a lot of writing um, and producing these, these sorts of content. So I'll leave it there and you can ask me. Yeah, we will. We'll go back to the, the how you got there. Um, okay. One of the other questions we asked Jemima was, what does that mean on a daily basis? So what, what do you do on a weekly basis? Because sometimes jobs, it's not a daily thing that you do that's the same. So what, what does that look like? What happens when you go into the office in the morning? Yeah, well, currently my office is my bedroom. Uh, and in, in this world, we, we're not going back to the office just yet. But when I was going into the office, and even um, now, I'm usually on the phone talking to many different um, what we call stakeholders within the EY business. So a lot of different business uh, leaders who want to understand what we're writing about, what the current trends are in relation to, say, climate change or artificial intelligence um, or, you know, the future of work. That's a really hot topic right now. 
Um, I will spend probably half of my day talking about that. Um, and the other half of the day will be managing my team members, will be reporting to more senior people. Um, I do a lot of sort of operational and budget type work. So um, to keep my team running, we have a budget, we have forecasting that we have to uh, deliver on every month. I actually have a meeting about that later today. Um, and so it is a mix of a whole lot of different skills so from a people um, skill uh, basis, but also from a from a quantitative um, uh, basis. We do a lot of, uh, I will often try and take some time out of my day to kind of walk away from the computer and sort of have some thinking time about sort of the issues that we're, we're thinking about and, and the outcomes of some of the research that we've done. So um, I will then go ahead and, and review kind of the, you know, survey analysis and survey data and think about ways to present that in a way that would make sense to the business community. Okay, so you both sound as though you take quite big and large concepts that are out there, sometimes quite ethereal and not necessarily quite hard, but you have to somehow bring it down and use numbers mm -hmm. to make it all work. That's that's question. When you were at school and on your way through your career, was maths always a passion for you or is that just something that you've developed as you've gone through your career and the, through the different jobs that you've taken to get there? And sure. I know you can start. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, I've always been, I suppose, quite, I've always been on the science side of things. Um, so for A-levels, I studied maths and uh, economics and biology. And then at university, I studied natural sciences. I went to Durham University in the north of England. Um, so what that means is I spent my dissertation in South Africa running around after giraffes and blesbok and kudu, particular types of ungulates, um, trying to understand why they were grazing in certain areas, um, which is obviously completely unrelated to infrastructure. And, um, but that's not the point. The point was it was a very, uh, it was quite a mathematical degree because in studying those animals, I had to understand why they were uh, operating in certain areas. And again, like building models to try and for example, if we cut the grass in one area, would that mean the animals fed in that area more? Those kind of basic high levels. Um, I then, when I left university, I uh, worked in a large American investment bank for a couple of years before moving to my current role. And um, I think when I was interviewing for that graduate job, my first job out of university, the, the immediate question was, well, why did you study biology? How is that relevant to a job in banking? I think mean, the key answer to that question question is it's not relevant but it had very very transferable skills probably the most crucial of which was maths and without having done quite a numerical degree where I was really trying to under you know uh, just take a understand big data sets and apply statistical analysis to them um, I probably wouldn't have got that first job and then be where I am now. Okay and Nadia what about you? Yeah I am um, I've always had a, a passion for maths I think I was trying to remember you know where it stemmed from and I think for me even just the process of um of going through problem solving there was always for me like it felt good to arrive at a destination when you know when you've solved the, mm -hmm. the problem through math I felt that um yeah I've always had this kind of a, attraction to it I, I studied that um you can probably tell by my accent I'm Australian and so I studied in Australia which we and we have probably different sounding courses but essentially they're the same I did um physics um and 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 quantitative maths when I was younger um and that has always kind of transitioned or flowed just like Jemima through to my university degree and actually we have a very similar background in that I also studied um, uh, science at university, earth and environmental uh, sciences, was always really interested in the land and natural systems and processes. So Alison, when you mentioned that idea of understanding kind of ecosystems and how things kind of fit in together, um, absolutely math was always a, a, a part of that. Um, I did a lot of technical kind of field surveys, just like Jemima, instead of running around in South Africa, I was running around in a small island called Rotness Island, running after quokkas, which are very cute and small, um, and, uh, and counting, you know, and, and uh, extrapolating what their population might be on, um, on the island. And, you know, I obviously don't do that 
anymore, but that idea to uh, involve kind of critical thinking and using some kind of science-based techniques has always served me well throughout school, throughout university, and now into this career, um, using, I guess, using a foundation of, of math in, in many different ways has helped me to become more of a critical thinker and problem solver, I think. Okay, it's quite interesting that both of you did very hardcore science subjects at university and you chose that and th I mean that's one of the issues that the Mass for Girls project is looking at is to try and encourage girls to take that forward so they can go into different careers. So did you find when you were at school there were you were unusual for taking that route or was it perfectly normal within your social circle or did you feel you there were any barriers to you getting there or or was it all just perfectly normal and that was just what you did and it's what your passion was so that's where you went i don't think i was normal <laughs> <laughs> and and probably and it's a good thing right like i think we're all have we all have fabulous unique skills i was i think i was we had two out of ten in my physics physics class that were girls. I always felt like a small kind of a minority in my class. I went to a co-educational school, so we were always kind of outnumbered in the technical skills by the, by the boys. I would hope that that's not the same these days, but I know that sometimes that, that girls can be outnumbered. Mm -hmm. I think, um, you know, the, the, the barriers were just that kind of, you know, we were we we looked different we you know the girls kind of sat with the girls and the boys sat with the boys and and maybe that's sort of natural at the time but i think when we got to university as well um that that dissolved a little bit there were you know and perhaps it was just the school that i went to but it, it felt that we were on a bit more of an even playing field i have to say there's still definitely work to do even in the workplace there are still barriers um, for women but we have many many amazing role models that are doing the work to kind of you know remove those barriers which are sometimes invisible I wouldn't say we've solved it um, but certainly I think it's probably easier to enter the workplace or to enter university in these more technical quantitative subjects now was perhaps say 20 years ago. How about you Jemima? Same experience? Um, yeah, I, I went to an all-girls school, so it wasn't so obvious uh, as to the minority, but yes, I would say probably the, the physics, I also did physics as well, and like, I'd say the physics class is probably smaller than the history class, just to take a you know, non-mathematical example. Um, I think the thing I would say is that when I was at school, and I think this is why these programmes that you do are so fantastic, is that I think very much my perception was, if I study physics, I'm going to have to be a physicist, or I'm going to have to be an engineer, or if I study chemistry I'm going to have to be a pharmaceutical scientist you know it was very um, academic related whereas I think the reality is like now now I'm actually in the world of work and all my you know all my friends are in the world of work and looking at the diversity of jobs that we all do I would be hard pushed to find a job that doesn't require numerical skills um, other than a few friends that work in the pure creative industries I think whatever really whatever you do, if you're in some kind of commercial role, you're going to need to have an understanding of maths and um, you need to have a level of numeracy. I think, um, I do remember, so yes, when I was at university, there were, I mean, biology was a, was a kind of a quite actually 50-50 class, but I also did some economics classes at university as well, and that was very boy heavy. Um, when I got into banking, so my, my, my graduate role, uh, again, there were exactly what Nadia was saying, like there were fewer girls and there's work to be done, even though the bank was making a lot of effort to hire as many as possible. Um, I did notice that there were a few girls who hadn't studied maths at A-level and they were noticeably disadvantaged, not because they were any less intelligent, it was just because they weren't used to it and they hadn't had the practice in the last few years. And so I think looking back, they would have really benefited from studying maths at A-level, even though of course you don't have to do it at university. We're not, we're not advocating doing pure maths at university unless of course you are truly passionate about it. Yeah, yeah, oh, well, that's very much, it's, it's a transferable, uh, aspect of it that we feel mm. very very important and it can end up being a barrier sometimes when everything else is there which is such a shame okay we do have some questions that have come in 
Um, so which one first? Okay, have you ever doubted your own abilities and how do you overcome your doubts? Nada, you go first. I'm just going to turn the light on again in my room. <laughs> okay. um, yes, yes, all the time, if I'm, if I'm honest. I think um, we suffer, not just women, but, you know, everybody suffers from this idea of imposter syndrome. I don't know if you've heard of that, but essentially kind of like I don't deserve to be here or wait till they find out that I'm not who are you know good enough or or that I think that you carry that with you and you have to do the work to kind of you know talk to people and understand that you absolutely are you know when we hire people we know how good they are because they've done you know we've interviewed them they've done the um they've you know we look at their grades, we also understand their attitudes and, and who they are as a person. And I think, you know, having this idea of, you know, I'm an imposter can help to propel you and help you to try harder, but it's only effective to a point. So um, I think knowing that, but also understanding that everybody feels that way, it's not just you, um, has helped me massively throughout my career. And I, you know, I think having mentors and role models that you can talk to, and also peers that you talk to, like your friends that say, do you feel this way? Just knowing that you're not alone in that can, can go miles to helping you along, I think, or it's helped me, essentially. Yeah. I, I would echo that. Yeah, me too, to be careful. Okay. Where does your passion come from and what do you do when it dips? That's one thing young people are always told to do, find your passion. And often when you're talking to teenagers, they're just like, I, I, I don't know. I don't, how am I meant to do that? They don't have the life experience to necessarily articulate that. So how, what, what is your passion? How did you find it? What do you do when it dips? Um, I, well, as I said at the beginning, I, if you had told me, so I graduated uh, four, four years ago. If you told me when I graduated that I'd be working a job building airports, I would have laughed. Um, but it's, I love it. It's fascinating. I love working with assets that everybody can relate to, that everybody can use. Um, uh, I completely agree with you. How on earth do you know what your passion is when you're at A-level, at university, or even, I mean, I don't know what I'm going to be doing in five years' time. It might not be infrastructure. It might be something completely different. So I think my advice in that in response to that question is just go don't worry so much about the future just do your best as you can in your current role do it to your absolute maximum effort and opportunities will rise from there and also exactly as Nadia said like network you know take the time to attend industry events speak to people go for coffees because it's through volunteer for ad hoc projects because it's through doing those that you'll meet new people and you might new, um, find a completely new career area that you didn't otherwise know existed yeah i mean to totally jemima i think you know i didn't know what i wanted to be i started out as an accountant i did that for a few years it was a great Sort of side, but that wasn't my passion ever. It was a, a stepping stone to get me to the next place, to the next place. And then I kind of, I mean, I've always gone back to nature, gone back to my love for dinosaurs. Um, that is, that is kind of the, what has fueled me. And that's why I've pursued this kind of career in kind of, you know, in climate change, sustainability, but also merging it with business issues. And I feel like sometimes it's not going to be abundantly clear, you know, the the pathway most of the time a lot of us haven't figured it out yet but there will be kind of intersections or places where you'll find a niche or something that you'll you'll go right that's really amazing you know the the, the intersection between art and math or, or whatever it is or you know I think there's not always just this defined kind of pathway I think to answer your question when my passion dips it, it is really hard you have to look out for your for yourself sometimes working um, it's not all it's cut out to be it's not super glamorous it's it's awesome because you can make a change um, but you have to look after your mental health as well and take time to just you know look, look after yourself step away whether it's from from the textbooks or from the screen I think that reconnect for me anyway reconnecting with nature going for a walk is a really simple way to just go right what am I doing and 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 getting some headspace as well because we can get so so busy all the time 
Okay, thanks. Um, and some good tips there. Uh, we've not got much time left, and this is quite a big question that I'm going to ask you. So I'm really just looking for the first thing that comes into your head with it. But what are the jobs of tomorrow, and how do we best prepare for them? So honestly, first thing off the top of your head, what, what, what do you, where do you think, especially in your industry, where do you think jobs are going? And it, for me, it's obviously sustainability. Um, I'm, I'm working on a, so we're at Allianz Global Investors, we're building out our presence in emerging markets and we're making investments in very low income countries to help make an impact. And um, the money is so desperately needed there are trillions, there's a trillions of fun, US dollar funding gap between the money that's needed in these countries and what we have in the developing world. So I'm not saying you need to go and work in Kazakhstan or Madagascar to go and do that job, but you can, you, it's areas of the Western world intersecting with those um, helping development that I think is really important. Okay. How about you, Nadia? I've got... Two things. I would narrow down, definitely, I agree with Jemima, and I would even narrow down even further to understand how do we, we have, you know, a finite planet. So how do we operate within the confines of this one planet? And we waste a lot. So how can we turn waste into resources? So, and that's in many different aspects. So I would kind of think about that. Um, and the other, I guess the other thing would be around um, digital, you know, we're, we're, in this world of digital and we're already here and probably is a, a job of today but i think it will just continue to be to be a role of tomorrow okay great okay so that's that's the last of the questions answered i have one more question for you both what would be your top tip to yourself when you were back in school Oh, I just say, um, sorry, to my mom, just, uh, no, 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 go ahead. I, just, I, I honestly would just say, just honestly believe in yourself and back yourself. Like there's so many times where I was like, oh, I can't do this. I'm not good enough. But, you know, you will find great people along the way to help you. But just know that you are absolutely fantastic and, and keep on going and back yourself. Okay, great. Thank you. Jemima? Um, I would say get involved. Every music, sports, position of responsibility, charity event, committee, just go for it. Like as many hours as you have in the day, do as much as possible because um, I, I believe that you, you gain as much if not more from those activities. You, you've broken up a little bit in my feed, but I would echo that definitely. And do maths. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay well thank you very much both of you for that that was that was really interesting and i enjoyed that greatly um for everybody who's potentially listening our next sessions are on friday and um, where one of our guests is actually going to be a sea captain which is a little bit different so we hope to see you there and um, thank you again jemima and nadia if you want to follow us, you can do it across multiple social media channels. Basically, I think the only one we're not on is TikTok at the moment. So you can find us wherever. And um, we will be putting this recording on our platform and on our YouTube channel. So if you want to go back and listen to anything, please do. Thank you both and goodbye, everybody. <laughs>